The king of the gangsters is about to get his, and a lot of Chicago folks are on hand at federal court for a last look at Scarface Al Capone before Uncle Sam puts him away. Here he comes. The big boy himself. What's the hurry, Al? Where you're going, you'll have loads of time. Welcome, all you wiretappers out there. Good to be back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I am calling a man that I, I happen to see this title on Facebook or something, and it was sounded so interesting. Al Capone and the 1933 World's Fair is the title of his book, William Hazelgrove. Did I get that right, William? Yep. Yes. Great. Well, welcome, William. I really uh, am happy to have you on the show and want to talk about your book. Oh, thanks for having me. So the 1933 World's Fair, uh, you know, I, I, there was a lot going on in Chicago during that time. So anyhow, the, the, the 1933 World's Fair and Al Capone, uh, William, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you, uh, are you a writer by trade or what, what have you done? What other books? Uh, yeah, I uh, started, I got a master's in history and then wrote my first novel and, uh, can't published uh by a small press yeah. and then i wrote a second one and that was picked up by random house and uh they gave me an advance on that and the third one and so then i i just, I just took off running from there yeah i published 10 novels and then i switched to what people call today narrative nonfiction, which yeah. is what al capone and the 33 fair is and what eric larson devil in the white city is it's where you take uh sort of the tricks of the novelist and apply it to history all my books are footnoted. They're all true, but they're told like a story. So you'll get right into it. So, you know, that's, I basically have been, uh, you know, writing for a long time. I have about 23 books and uh, they're all pretty much first half saying this, I realize it's not true. First half of the American century, uh, the 20th century, mm -hmm. but two of them are uh, based colonial. That's Morristown. The Secret Plot to Kidnap George Washington, Henry Knox's Noble Train. So those are 18th century, but everything else is 20th century, first half. All right. Well, Al Capone, he, he's probably one of the most written about uh, mobsters in Chicago people ever, I, I would imagine. And he's as a never ending source of stories about Al Capone. He's immensely popular. And, and and then connecting this to the 1933 World's Fair, I think, is is you've got a, a pretty good angle there for something a little bit different. Because a World's Fair, there had to be a ton of money coming in that town. And, you know, when the money starts flowing, uh, Al Capone and the mafia start looking for ways to get some of that money. Yeah, well, um, 1933 is the worst year of the Great Depression. So Chicago really was bucking the trend by having this fair at all. So the first fair was 1893. This was the century of progress, 1933. Um, Capone was basically running a hundred million dollars a year operation in Chicago, uh, you know, bootlegging. Um, he and Bugs Moran were facing off uh, constantly uh, right up to the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Now, when the St. Valentine's Day massacre happened, um, this really sent a shot across the country, really, and especially through Chicago, where they realized if they didn't get Capone, nobody would come to this fair because nobody would come to Chicago. And I live in Chicago. And um, so that's why, that's why I made the connection. I actually was writing a book about the 33 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. And then I stumbled into this Capone connection, and I realized this is very much part of it. So, you know, I'm sure all your listeners have uh, seen The Untouchables. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, I'm not going to jump ahead here yet and spill the beans, but that <laughs> that is just not true, that whole movie. Um, yeah, well. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we can go into that, too. But uh, the point is Capone had to go before the fair happened. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the feds... Uh... The tax people really is who went after Capone. I did a story on the trial about Capone it was pretty interesting, uh, who the jury was and, and how all that went down, how they swapped juries on him. But they started after him because of the World Fair. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, actually. Yeah. OK, that's what you're saying. Yes. Um, so. The story goes uh, the, in the movie and such is Elliot Ness came down, the treasury agent, 
they had this group of guys who were called the untouchables yeah. who would get Capone. Okay. Elliot Ness did come to Chicago. He was a treasury agent, but there were no untouchables. A guy named Oscar Fraley wrote that. Uh, that was um, Ness got together with him later in the 50s. They uh, Fraley added all this stuff. Yeah. And that's how that all came about. The real truth is there was a group of men called the Secret Six. <laughs> and the Secret Six um, were six millionaires from Chicago who decided to create a secret police force um, you know, complete was a witness protection program, uh, informants, mobster informants in their own speakeasy. And they're the ones who got Capone. And, uh, and then that led to a uh, tax evasion case, which, by the way, nobody went to jail for taxes at this time because nobody yeah. even barely hit the threshold of $5,000 to be taxed. But, you know, Capone famously um, was going to, you know, strike a deal. Um, he was going to get two years. Uh, and he went in front of a guy named Judge Wilkerson, you know, for not paying taxes. And Wilkerson said, no, 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 we aren't, we aren't going to do that. And the reason is because the president called him and said, you know what, you can't send him away for two years. You got to send him away for a long time. Mm -hmm. So Capone had to go to jail. And as you said, he, he bribes the jury. They find out, they switch it on them. And just so your listeners know who these, uh, I again, I live in Chicago, but the new jury was from downstate Illinois, which is all farms. <laughs> yeah. And that really um, sunk Capone because everybody else, I mean, for your listeners, uh, you know, we have a view of Capone as his murdering gangster. I can't tell you how many speeches I've given and how many times I'm in Barnes and Noble, people come to me and say, Capone was a great man. He saved yeah. my family. Now, why would he say that? Well, because Capone was viewed like a celebrity then. Um, whenever he came to trial, he would be mobbed. Um, he had a $50,000 ring on his finger. He had a white fedora. He was like a sports figure as today. And he gave out a lot of money. Mm -hmm. During the Great Depression, Chicago was broke, 25% unemployment. Capone set up soup kitchens all over the South Side and gave out donuts and soup and people knew who was behind it yeah and a lot of people worked for him so this is why our view of him of saying oh he was this terrible guy that was not held by people then mm -hmm. so then the the world's fair so they uh what how was he connected to that was that just because they that was the impetus to go after capone to uh, get capone yeah kind of yeah movement? absolutely um they had to get rid of him or nobody would come to the city because what happened with the St. Valentine's Day massacre was uh, they used Thompson machine guns on the seven guys, the seven Moran men. Right. And they were very gory. The crime scene photos are all in Chicago history museum. And I've seen them. Newspapers all had a, a tacit agreement not to put gory photos into, um, onto the, into newspapers. Well, they violated it. And so all of the front pages, all over the country were, you know, Gangsters are mowing people down. Um, <laughs> cops are mowing people down in Chicago. Oh, by the way, we're having a World's Fair. Come to Chicago. <laughs> so they all realized then they had to get rid of Capone. So really it was a race was on. The race was on to try and get rid of Al Capone. And so that's, you know, as the fair is being built, and in the book, um, I split the book between, you know, the, the campaign to get Capone and then the building of this fair, which was really fascinating because, uh, they had no money, and it was built on what's called Norley Island. Norley Island is where all the debris from the Chicago fire was pushed into the lake, mm. so it formed an island. Um, so but what that meant was there were no building codes. So for the uh, World's Fair, they came up with all sorts of innovative things, plywood. Plywood came out of the 33 World's Fair, and you think, well, so what? Well, it's a big deal. There's yeah. no more plaster and lath. Uh, sheetrock, another big innovation of the fair. But they used again. They could tape up these walls and and make these buildings very fast. This is uh, this fair was built by a guy named Lennox Lar, who was a military man, and he designed it to be built very quickly and then torn down very quickly. Yeah. So the whole fair, uh, just uh, so your listeners know, when this fair was completed, it used as much power as Madison, Wisconsin, had its own police department, fire department, hospital, and employed twenty thousand people. So this is yeah. a massive massive fair 
Uh, now, what is there for these guys that live in Chicago? What's there today if somebody wanted to drive by and take a look? Uh, nothing. Was? Um, they tore everything down. There is a uh, sort of a monument from the Italians that's still there. And that's it. Uh, from the 1893 fair, we had the Field Museum and a bunch of buildings that yeah. survived. From this fair, there's virtually nothing. Mm. So is it like if you're going, if it, where is it from, say, Navy Pier? Is it? North or South? Oh, yeah. So, right, you would just go straight south from Navy Pier. Okay. That's all Northerly Island. So, all right, you know, let's talk a little bit about Sally Rand, because Sally Rand came to fame during this time. Yeah. And uh, for your listeners, Sally Rand, um, her real name is Harriet Beck. She's a hillbilly. Um, She's from uh, the Ozarks. And she runs away with the circus three times. Third time, she gets all the way to the coast, bumps into an unknown producer named Cecil B. DeMills. (laughs) <laughs> who says what's your name and she says well it's harriet beck and he says no 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 that's not gonna work and he goes he looks around and sees an atlas he says it's sally rand so then he <laughs> puts her into all these silent movies and amazingly she's only five foot tall but she's uh, fearless uh she's in some senate films and things like that where she jumps into buckets of water and all sorts <laughs> of crazy stuff um but he puts her into films and she starts to become a silent movie star which is amazing that this woman who basically came to the West Coast with the circus, is now becoming a real star. Well, the jazz singer comes out, which is, uh, you know, the talkies, for right. talk with Al Jolson, who comes on the screen and says, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and then uh, everybody has to take a, a sound test. Sally Rand has an Ozark accent and a lisp. Yeah. So Cecil B. DeMille gives her her walking papers. All right. So she leaves and goes to Chicago. She ends up sleeping in alleys. It's a Great Depression. She goes down to a club called the Paramount Club, picks up some uh, big seven-foot ostrich feathers from a store on State Street, goes to Paramount Club, tries out with nothing on but the using the feathers, fl- you know, flashing back and forth. Yeah. She gets a job. Well, then she decides. She wants to get back to Hollywood, but she decides, well, I'm going to go try out for this fair, this century of progress. She does. They go, you know what? We don't need a fan dancer. So she hatches a plan. She gets a boat. A horse, she put and puts her whole body in this white makeup, but that's it. And now remember, the fair's on Northern Island, so it's not actually on Chicago property. You have to get across the water to get to it. So she takes this boat out around to a yacht landing behind the fair. First night of the fair, all the muckety mucks are there, big stage. She jumps on the horse, rides to the fairgrounds, it goes up onto the stage, rears up. People go, Oh my god, it's a naked woman on a white horse. <laughs> it's the Chicago World's Fair. They immediately arrest her and then immediately hire her. She (laughs) becomes instantly famous. And she is literally, and it's hard to believe, the reason the 1933 World's Fair made money. Because Mm -hmm. before that, it was in the the red. Then it became in the black. She had a little 17-minute show. People just lined up, up, and up. And this began, believe it or not, a 40-year career for her that culminated in her dancing for the Apollo astronauts in Houston uh, uh, Astrodome, <laughs> not the Astrodome, the Houston Coliseum. Oh, my darn. Sally mm-hmm. Rand and famous for the fe- the feathers that she'd put in front of her naked body, supposedly. <laughs> That's right. And she actually worked for Capone for a while, too. It seemed like everybody worked for Capone at one yeah. time or another. And, uh, um, you know, he just he he just had such a lock on the city. You either were working for him on his payroll or you were in a trunk in Indiana, you know. Yeah. And and if you're a politician, you did what he said. So speak and Big Bill Thompson, William Big Bill Thompson, he was the mayor during this time. Right, right, exactly. And uh, famously, uh, whenever anybody ran against them, their you know their poll their polling headquarters were bombed and people shot and you know and basically Capone ensured that Thompson would stay. But Capone ran the city from the Lexington Hotel. Yeah, he um he had a steel back chair so if somebody came in and tried to shoot him he'd be okay he had an armored car um and you know we haven't talked this about this much but you know thompson machine guns really made their mark with capone he's yeah. the one who really brought those to bear uh and those were actually called invented by a guy named general thompson in world war one who wanted to kill germans really quickly and he he called it the annihilator but those those 45 ACP slugs uh, just tore up, you know, people and cars and all sorts of things. And, and that was really Capone's trademark at the time. 
Yeah, and you they were everywhere back then. I, I even saw an old ad in a a like a hardware store out in the country that was wanting to sell machine guns. <laughs> and mm-hmm. of course that's probably when they put that big tax on them and, and they never did make machines gun machine guns illegal. A lot of people think they're illegal. They're not illegal. You just have to pay back then with an uh, exorbitant tax, a five hundred dollar right. tax to buy one to get a license right. to buy one. Now it's not now it's not anything now that that kind of a tax. So I would imagine that uh, bootlegging was really going crazy during with all these visitors in town. That I would imagine people came to town. A lot of people came to town wanting, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the wild time, the sex and drinking. Even though it was, you know, it was the uh, uh, the thirties. It was a little. It wasn't the twenties, but a lot of that was left over. So I would imagine the prohibition. Uh, laws were were uh, suspended during that time. Of course, I don't know if they really enforced the prohibition laws in Chicago ever. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because when prohibition came in, it really changed the way people drank. Before that, pe- men would get together with men in a saloon. After prohibition, people would get dressed up. They'd go to a speakeasy in Chicago. I had more speakeasies than any city. And they go in and say, Johnny sent me. And then you go in there and, you know, it'd be jazz, there's interracial mixing, there's sex. And this is really where, you know, partying, as we know it, began. People drank more than ever before. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, made a living off of it, calling the greatest party ever. Um, You know, and, and what's interesting is Walgreens drug stores, which are local here, uh, really grew crazily during this time. One reason they grew so much was um, you could go in there and get a you know prescription for some Everclear and go mix it up with lime juice. It's called a box car, and you know it tastes like lighter fluid. But um, you know that's how that's that chain grew. And then you know Capone, you know a lot of people think Capone was just this this gangster. He was actually a very good businessman. He had an immense operation, and he bottled all sorts of things. His uh, brother Frank Capone. Invented his own soda pop called Green River. Maybe you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Capone also bottled milk. And as a kid in Brooklyn, he hated the fact his milk was always spoiled. Well, he had the same problems when he was bottling it, so he decided to date the bottles. Mm-hmm. And that spent you know spread out and became an industry standard. So when you go to get your milk tonight, thank Al Capone. There's a date on that bottle. <laughs> that is really interesting. Any other little interesting uh, uh, tidbits about Capone? Uh, from that oh yeah, time. well, sure. Um, I talked to the uh, the gentleman who did his teeth and um, the dentist, and they said uh, the way it would work is Capone would be um, would come in with some goons, walk through the waiting room, no matter how many people were in there, walk into the dentist's office, pull whoever's in the chair out. <laughs> Capone would sit down. The his bodyguards would take out their guns, put them out on the table. And the dentist would start to work. And then the dentist would say to one of the bodyguards, this is going to hurt. And then the bodyguard <laughs> would say to Capone, this is going to hurt. And, so, and then the dentist would do it. When he was done, Capone gave him a big wad of money in an envelope and they yeah. left. I'll be done. And, and I also met the woman who shoveled his walk. Hmm. Um, and she uh, in Cicero and his house is still there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Capone could never stay on the first floor of his house, by the way. And if your listeners aren't familiar with Chicago, Chicago has lots and lots of bungalows. They're like little brick yeah. forts, and uh, especially on the south side. And so um, Capone would have to always be on the second floor because somebody could come by the machine gun and rake the first floor. Mm-hmm. But this woman who did his uh, drive uh, said he would always come out and give her candy. It was very, very nice. Um, a lot of and his family members always say Capone loved popcorn and big family dinners and you know, um, he's a family man. Um, and, you know, I mean, and this is like story after story, story. Another gentleman came into Barnes and Noble and told me, um, he said, yeah, you know, my, my mother used to date Capone. I go, really? She goes, yeah, she was a showgirl. I go, oh, I go, did you ever meet him? He goes once. I go, what happened? He said, well, my mother and Capone got into a fight. And so the, these guys came in a car and picked me up, took me to a bar, and I was sitting in front of this big Italian guy who was slapping me around. And he goes, that was Capone. And I said, well, what do you think? And he says, oh, nice guy, nice guy. 
That's crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he owned Chicago at the time, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. But that Lexington Hotel, that was down in Cicero. And I think when Cicero, kind of like a, 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 a sin city down there with tons of bars with. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of gambling. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, there's the south side, southwest side. And so, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty wide open. Um, you know, I mean, with Capone, whenever you see um, photos of him, and again, this is hard for people to believe, um, but he, you know, he's always in pictures with like police or with judges or whoever. And this is because the lines were not clearly drawn more the way they are now, supposedly. Um, everybody was sort of in in on it, in on the fix, and also, especially during hard times, you know, people needed money, and Capone provided a lot of money for people in the city, pe you know, people who work. I mean, I can't tell you how many people told me they made bathtub gin. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and how many people said that they worked for him? I talked to one gentleman who said he uh, got picked up by Capone's men. They said, are you a welder? He said, yes, I am. He goes, come on. And they took him, and they took him to where Capone's distilleries were, and they needed to be welded. So this guy welded them, and they gave him some money, took him, dropped him off. He said it happened like three times. He said after the fourth, third time, he couldn't stand it, so he moved away. <laughs> These guys just pick him up in the middle of the night. But, I mean, he really did uh, employ a lot of people. He he provided in a time when money was hard to be found. Mm -hmm. um, he provided an immense amount of money. you know, And so people in the city just looked the other way in Chicago. Yeah. They just did not crack down on him. And it was, you know, it was really because he became a liability with the fair coming mm -hmm. that, you know, and also the St. Valentine's day massacre was a real mistake um, because I mean, today we still don't know exactly who, who did it, but you know, you can bet Capone was behind it, but it was a real mistake because it was too big. It was, yeah, it was too much. Uh, and that's really what put him on the, well, the radar of the president, uh, the United States yeah. Harding wanted to get rid of him, you know, uh, no, or is it who Hoover? Hoover wanted to get rid of him. Hoover, yeah. And uh and so you know, he'd become a liability. You know, let's uh, let's talk just a little bit more before we end this about that time and that you mentioned something about how the the lines between uh proper society, if you will, and and the mob organized crime were were blurred. And it was the same way here in Kansas City. But they they were all, they were part of the community. They, you know, they, they provided a service. Everybody wanted to drink <laughs> and, yeah, and that's yeah. who provide that service. And, and they mixed in those places and except for the, the real, you know, uh, silk stocking kind of, and they got had their own ways of getting booze, but the real silk stocking people and the, the, uh, you know, stiff back Protestants were, you know, they stayed away, but boy, everybody else, they were, you know, they were all mixing it up in the same places, the same clubs and the politics, they mix it up in politics, of course, and, and provide, help provide jobs. The mob was partners up with a, a Irish guy named Pendergast here in Kansas city. And, and he would hold court every day and poor people would get in the line and come up and they might get a bucket of coal or they get, get a job or, or some kind of a handout. They were the, social welfare help the safety net for people back then and and so it's so different i assume it was somewhat similar in chicago from what you're saying with al capone running soup kitchens and yeah uh, i mean capone had a quote where he said um you know down here in the loop the loop is the south loop the south part of the city he said down here in the loop they call it bootleg and the north shore they call it hospitality i'm the yeah. supply you, <laughs> you know in the north shore it's where all the mucky marks live so no, uh, there is definitely a, a sort of collusion, if you will, between, you know, especially in Capone's time between him and government officials. And that's why he never was arrested. He he could drag them to court, but the fix was always in. So he was always released. You know, they could never pin anything on him. And really, the reason they ended up on the tax charge was it was really all they could get him on. I mean, he was... He never uh, did anything in writing. He he was uh, he never officially took an income. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so they could never really do a paper trail. So really his lawyer did him in. His lawyer said, well, well he, said, he sent a letter and he said, okay, Capone made about a hundred grand and he didn't pay tax. And we'll, we'll do a deal on that just to sort of get them off their backs. But really if that lawyer hadn't written that letter, the government had nothing. I mean, and with all their investigation, everything there, because nobody would testify against them. <laughs> You know, so and he was very layered. You know, his organization was huge. He had um, planes flying in from Canada, landing on Lake Michigan. He had rum runners, you know, shooting across Lake Michigan um, up north, getting booze, bringing it down. Um, he again, he had a huge bottling operation. He had all these trucks. Um, you know, he had these massive amount of you know speakeasies that were on the payroll and stuff that he would go around and supply. So, I mean, he was running a very big operation. And so a lot of money went out a lot of different ways from that. Um, and so, you know, he, he, he's, a, he was a hard guy to, to sort of pin down and say, okay, we can convict him for this. And that when you think about it, um, convict him for income tax evasion was hilarious because, you know, he had been, running all those booze and knocked yeah. off a lot of people and, and, and they get the best they could do was uh, get them for income tax evasion. That's called the Capone prosecution, by the way. And they use that against OJ Simpson. Uh, if you could call OJ Simpson, yeah. they couldn't get him for killing his wife and her lover. Right. Yeah. what they get him for? They got him for, uh, you know, holding up some guys who were taking his football trophies <laughs> yeah. in a hotel. And they sent him away for 11 years for that, yeah. which is exactly what Capone got us sent away. And we'll talk a little bit Capone. When Capone got sent away, um, it was for 11 years. And his first uh, jail cell was very lavish in Atlanta. And so people got upset. And so they sent him to Alcatraz, yeah. which that. was, you know, no talking, solitary confinement. And of course, Capone had syphilis. So he was slowly losing his mind. And um, I don't know if you remember that Gerardo Rivera special where he opened up Capone's vault. Capone's vault. Way back oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And uh, there was nothing in it. Yeah. Well, what he was looking for was this. Capone, because of the syphilis, could not remember where he buried all his money, <laughs> his fortune. And so Gerardo Rivera thought it was in that vault yeah and of course it wasn't and to this day nobody's found it Hmm. so it's sort of the the great mystery but uh you know he did get out of jail and he didn't go back to the mob he but he did you know live for a while and with his family and you know he's buried in mount carmel cemetery but a lot of people say he's not there because they don't want anybody picking him up and yeah so yeah, are there are there a lot of stories about where his uh, where he might have buried a lot of money that floated around? You know, it, up there? there there are, um, and it always turns out to be, you know, just a red herring. There was actually a guy came and talked to me who was going to do a television show about trying to find where this money is. I don't know if they ever got it off the ground. Yeah, um, but you know, hard to know. Hard to know if. Capone gave it to somebody, you know, if somebody held it, somebody took it, um, you know, but his wife, May, and his son, Sonny, the, the mob took care of them because Capone mm-hmm. was basically broke. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of these mob guys, almost all of them, if they're any, have any success at all, will have a cash hoard somewhere. Uh, right. that you'd really never, ever find. And, and so I'm sure he probably did. And probably his wife knew, knew where it was and somebody else took care of it. And then they took care of her more than likely. But right. <laughs> that's like the holy grail of, of mob uh, uh, mob lore out there. There's people that collect, you know, mob uh, autographs. There's people that collect all kinds of, of mob things to find Al Capone's money would be that would be the uh the pinnacle of that little deal yeah right yeah, exactly right. you guys up in chicago the listeners up in chicago start looking for that money we'll do a show <laughs> on it <laughs> <laughs> interesting all right i you know is there is there uh one last story i guess uh just to back into the politics i noticed you mentioned something about the the murder of anton cermak what was this yeah, Anton Cermak was uh, assassinated standing next to FDR 
And he was the mayor who came in after William Thompson to clean up Chicago, to get rid of all the graft and, and, and get rid of uh, the mob and, and all that. And, uh, you know, he was shot down by a guy who they said was sort of a lone wolf. But the thought was always that it was revenge yeah, from Capone for what he you know, was, was doing in Chicago. And then you know, a lot of people thought that FDR was, at that time, I think it was this assistant secretary of the Navy, was the target. But that's not true. In fact, that's how they had to paint it. But it, it was probably a, a revenge hit, you know. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, you go back to, uh, like, you go back to the Secret Six, um, you know, Julius Rosenwald, the guys who got him, Julius Rosenwald was president of Sears, founder of Sears. He was mm-hmm. part of the Secret Six. Mm-hmm. Robert McCormick, he was also part of this uh, Secret Six, who was publisher of Chicago Tribune. Um, and, you know, these were very big men who, you know, were behind this effort to get rid of him and, mm-hmm. and funded this secret police force. So if, I, if your listeners take anything from this interview, it's the fact that it wasn't only at NAS, it was the secret six that uh, eventually got Capone. That's interesting about that secret police force. Has anybody ever really documented that or going into that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. There, there are, there's a lot of documentation on it. In fact, they not only went to Capone, they did all sorts of things. They had to be disbanded because like every vigilante force, they got yes. out of control. Oh yeah. And they, you know, they used their own methods. Um, yeah. But the one thing they did use uh, that, you know, unbelievably nobody was doing was they would send people down to South America so they could testify. And then they also used informants. They had their own mobsters, you know. And again, this is standard procedure today. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't do that back then, did they? Mm -mm. All right. Well, William Hazelgrove, Al Capone and the 1933 World's Fair. This is this has been great, William. I appreciate it. And you probably have a uh, an Amazon uh, author's page with all your books on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go to or you can go to WilliamHazelgrove.com or just okay. put in, uh, you know, I had a book that's coming out on Titanic called 160 Minutes, The Race to Save the RMS Titanic. Uh, you know, Anything to do with that or just Al Capone, 33 World's Fair, I'll pop yeah. up. I'll, I'll, I'll put links. Folks, I'll put links of that on okay. show, show notes and, and in the uh, the notes underneath the YouTube video. So, William, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And it, it's an interesting book. I'm going to have to get my hands on it. I didn't take time to get my hands on it before I uh, got in touch with you. You you came back so quick on me. I, I said, oh, let's just, let's just get him. He's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, no. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks a lot, William. Thank you. Right. Well, folks, don't forget to watch out for motorcycles. And uh, if you got, uh, if you're a veteran, you got any problems with PTSD, be sure and go to the VA website and, and use their hotline. A lot of good information there. And tell a friend about the podcast. And you know, hit me up on Venmo once in a while. Buy me a, a shot and a beer, as they say. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks a lot, folks.